agenda that we have for today uh, are some introductions. I'm going to introduce the uh, team at the University of Florida that's going to be uh, developing uh, the system. And, uh, and then we were hoping that the folks who are participating in the webinar would introduce themselves also. And then there's a, a couple of bullets that are basically for orientation, just to make sure we're all on the same page about what we're talking about. And then we move on to a discussion where we're trying to uh, assess what the needs are of institutions that can be served by the ARL PD Bank, and also uh, start to define some of the system specifications. And our overall goal uh, from this web and, and, and from the, the uh, limited number that we're going to be conducting uh, over the course of May uh, is for this to be an interactive discussion. There are about seven institutions that uh, might be represented if we have full attendance for today. And our hope is that ha having it be kind of small, uh, that we can actually uh, have a discussion and that the, the slideshow format will kind of uh, focus our discussion, but that it's, it's clearly um, not a passive presentation, but uh, we really need your input uh, on, on the design. Uh, the project team uh, from the University of Florida uh, includes uh, myself, uh, and I'm the overall lead for the project, and Bonnie Smith uh, and Lori Taylor, who are uh, co-PIs uh, for, for this. Uh, Bonnie's going to uh, uh, work most specifically on the communication uh, in soliciting the input with the other academic research libraries. And uh, Lori Taylor, who's the uh, former head of our Div digital services unit at the University of Florida and um, helped launch a self-submittal institutional repository uh, feature, is uh, going to help us in translating uh, the user needs into technical specifications. And then we're very lucky to have Mark Sullivan um, who's going to uh, be the application engineer for this, and he is going to work on the technical aspects of the project. And uh, this is the first opportunity for participation from you guys. We were hoping that um, you might introduce yourself and, um, and, and say what institution that you're from. Well, I'd be glad to start. I'm Nancy Hewison. I'm Associate Dean for Planning and Administration at Purdue University Libraries. And I do have an HR Administrator reporting to me, um, Julie Hillgrove, whom some of you have met. She is um, not at work today, or she would be involved in this as well. well Nancy, thanks for joining us. And I'm the Nancy next person? Right. I'm the Human Resources Officer for the Libraries at the University of Alabama. Hi, Angela. Hi. This is John Lehner. I'm the Associate Dean for Personnel Planning and Systems at the University of Houston Libraries. Hi, John. And Melinda um, Flannery just uh, joined us. Um, she's uh, right on time. Uh, we're happy to have you. We're um, going around and, and identifying who is on the, uh, who's on our webinar today. So I don't know if your microphone works, uh, but if you're able to do that, um, we, uh, I don't, it, uh, Melinda doesn't have a, um, a mic. Melinda, which institution are you from? From Rice. Okay, well, thanks for joining us. Uh, is there anyone else who has a functional mic that hasn't um, introduced themselves? Judy? Hi, this is Judy Rutenberg from ARL. Welcome. Hi, Brian. This is Sherry Williams from the University of Buffalo. I'm the Human Resources Officer for the University Libraries here in uh, Buffalo. Okay, well, welcome and, and thank you uh, for participating. Um, so we, we're really fortunate today to have a, a, a representation from a variety of institutions. and. Um, like I said, our real goal uh, today is to have an active participation. That's why we've limited the number. And um, I'm as, uh, there's no one who's more awkward in interacting with webinars than myself. So um, I, uh, I, I, but I, but we, so please don't be 
uh, nervous in sharing your comments. They're really critical uh, at this stage in the process. Um, so, as I said, uh, we were going to spend a fair amount of time on the orientation to this, uh, and uh, because I'm, I'm not 100% sure that we're all on the same page about the actual project, so I want to make make sure. Uh, and so I'll go through the orientation as quickly as, as possible and so we can move on to the discussions. But basic, the basic concepts in arriving at the idea for this project was that position descriptions are really important, uh, but they're only important if they're usable. And that would be maintained, updated, organized, and, and accessible. And that we're, uh, as institutions, I certainly can vouch for the University of Florida Libraries, we spend a fair amount of time um, archiving, retrieving, monitoring, distributing uh, the PDs, and uh, we basically do it through a, a file naming convention, and, and we have certain timelines, and um, it's the, there's not a system that makes it easy for us to do that. There's no, we do not have the benefit of something approximating a database, and I do know from experience, um, and we're probably one of the most frequent solicitors, uh, that we do share position descriptions. And um, we have found this to be a real valuable resource. So in coming up with the idea for the ARL PD Bank, these were, this was kind of the starting point. And the assumption of, of the proposal that we made to ARL was that if we had a free system that uh, made it easier or enhanced the management of these documents, that it would benefit the institutions. and if we could create a national level long-term arch long archive of PDs, um, that it would increase the information about our industry um, and that would, that would be beneficial. The um, premise of the whole uh, thing is that if we develop something that benefits us as individual institutions, that we will use it and maintain it. And if we're all using the same system, that this creates a, a um, that this creates a national uh, level, industry level resource uh, that we can all use um, in investigating position descriptions and the work of libraries. But it all starts with the idea of establishing a system that is uh, useful on the institutional level. And that's really what we, um, th those are the two things that we need to have in mind as we develop the, uh, the specs and the features and as we think about the sort of data that we'll collect, how will it serve the institutions and then eventually um, once uh, this is adopted how it would uh, be useful to us as a field. The project is uh, sponsored by ARL. Uh, they are uh, sponsoring the development of the system and it's going to be developed by a UF team I just introduced. and and it's dependent upon broad input from the other institutions. Uh, UF libraries have committed to, um, to hosting uh, the, the web system and the archives in perpetuity. And so uh, it's a partnership between ARL and the University of Florida that we're really uh, excited to be engaged in. The project timeline, uh, the agreement was reached with ARL at the very end of March and the uh, idea is over the next 12 months from that point that we would, uh, we would have a, a live system and we would complete uh, the, the, the project from, from UF standpoint. The first phase is a planning phase and that's really um, uh, trying to get our hands around uh, what we want the system to do, the, uh, how uh, people are likely to interact with the system to where it's as easy and effective for them as possible. Then we have an implementation which is um, going to take place in the second half of the year and then a launch phase. Uh, two critical dates associated with this are, uh, you'll see June 2012 and January 2013. Our intention is that there will be steady communication with the ARL institutions but that we will also, um, will also take advantage of the national conferences uh, for ALA. And, uh, and take advantage of the ACRL personnel officers group and other opportunities to uh, provide updates and solicit feedback. The planning phase, which is what we're currently in, is uh, an effort on our, includes an effort on our part to assess what institutions need and to develop the specifications and present them 
and get feedback on them. And so we're going to use uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, there's a couple in this first series, and then there's a couple in the next series of webinars where we will actually, uh, our intention is to provide some mock-ups of what we think the system will look like. The implementation phase is the second half of the year, and we will um, develop an actual system uh, and the support documentation for the institutions to know how to use it best, and uh, we'll do beta testing and evaluate feedback on the, on the beta system and then finalize the system and documentation. And then uh, in the spring of next year, uh, we will uh, make it available to the institutions, we'll publicize it, uh, provide user support uh, for people as, as they're adopting it, and uh, we'll also uh, do an evaluation. After the, that project is defined, um, the idea is that, again, successful adoption by the institutions uh, at the University of Florida is this becomes the vehicle by which we manage our um, position descriptions. We will, by definition, maintain those position descriptions. Uh, this will make it easier for us to do that. And by our continued use of this going forward, um, it will, we'll have an updated um, amount of data uh, that can be used by other institutions if they're interested in, in our positions and how we define the work at the libraries. And um, not mentioned on the slide, but after the project ends, though, as I mentioned, uh, the University of Florida Libraries will continue to host the system and archive uh, the data that's submitted, the documents that are submitted. And uh, the University of Florida, Bonnie and myself, uh, will continue to be uh, available to um, give technical advice to the institutions that are using the system. What we're hoping uh, from you guys and how I came to be talking to you today is some of you uh, folks volunteered on your own, some of you were volunteered by uh, the directors of your, in, of your libraries uh, when ARL uh, solicited uh, feedback on the viability of the system. And so that's how I came to be talking to you. Our hope is that your role during the planning phase by participating in the webinar and by um, other um, surveys and that sort of thing, that you'll help us determine what the needs are of our institutions so we can make sure the system addresses those, and that you'll also help us develop the system specifications. And then uh, in June, that you guys might be willing to uh, participate in the beta test and provide your feedback on that. Um, and so that's our hope. Uh, the, and as I mentioned before, the first series of uh, webinars that we're doing in the planning phase, this is one of them, uh, is uh, to uh, do the needs assessment and have a preliminary discussion. And then the next round that we're hoping you will participate in will, um, will be where we'll present some mock-ups and we'll focus on how the system, how we anticipate it to actually work. Uh, the design uh, that we anticipate that, that we're going to have is it's going to be a web application. Uh, documents and data associated with the position descriptions uh, would be uploaded uh, and then updated over time by institutions as either the metadata changes or the documents need to be updated. And uh, we will be able to accept text, PDF, Word documents. The intention is that we have a system that is simple, that's intuitive, and that it's easy to use and interface with. Those of us on this webinar may or may not be the people uh, that use this directly, uh, but our intention is to make it as straightforward to where um, if someone has the technical expertise to complete, complete an online transaction at Amazon.com or someplace, or to make an attachment to an email, that they'll have the expertise um, to, to be able to, to interact uh, easily with this system. Uh, we uh, will collect metadata, and we'll spend a, a fair amount of time today talking about what that metadata might look like. And that metadata and the keywords associated with the positions can be used for searching either on the institutional level or also um, on, on the broader industry level. Uh, the ability to customize and brand at an institutional level is envisioned also and the secure digital preservation of the documents that are submitted in the data is uh, inherent to the design. Uh, part of the standard uh, metadata that we've envisioned that we would uh, try and collect on every position, and we'll talk about whether these uh, hit the mark, whether these are the ones that we should be uh, thinking of, would be whether it's a full-time or part-time position, 
the Fair Labor Standards Act status, whether it's exempt or non-exempt, uh, the position type, which would be uh, for whether it's a professional librarian, another professional position, uh, support or paraprofessional uh, position, and um, the employment type, uh, we, we might want to d determine whether it's a contracted position, whether it's a uh, time-limited position, whether it's a tenure accruing or permanent status accruing position. We also thought that it might be useful to collect um, whether it is in a medical library, a law library, or other libraries. And there might be dates that um, would be relevant for us to, uh, for us to collect, either automatically or, or give people the opportunity uh, to, to enter those. And then a working title, uh, the idea that uh, we might have a, an assistant university librarian, but the working title is chemistry librarian or we may have a, um, a, a position that is a, um, an IT uh, expert as a classification at UF, but the working title could be um, web application programmer. The idea is that there's probably a lot of infor useful information in the working titles, not only um, for the way at the institutional level we think of the position, but also um, in, in, uh, in the ability for us to, as an industry to to access the information that's going to be in this archive. And then uh, the job type, um, we, the, the idea is that there are some standard job types that we're probably all pretty familiar with um, from the ARL salary survey uh, that we would use. And that would help when we're searching uh, through the data, it would help uh, for us to uh, be able to, to more effectively search. Uh, there's also the idea that we would, the, the, the fields I mentioned before were ones that are geared to where uh, anybody that has access to the database and that can search it would have access to. Uh, but there, we anticipate that there'll be a series of fields that are only viewable at the institutional level. At the University of Florida, we could um, enter employees' names, only we would see that. Um, and so, um, because they're not relevant to people outside of the institution. And some ones that we thought would be standard would be the employee's name, perhaps the supervisor's name, the position number, uh, some sort of department or branch level identifier, uh, either automatically or, or hard entered uh, dates, including the date it was reviewed or modified, and then a field to where we could enter notes uh, as necessary. Um, maybe the change in the position description reflected a, um, a promotion and we could note that or maybe um, uh, the position is becoming an inactive position and we would want to note um, the reason for that. And so those could be used um, by uh, the institution. And, and then to make this as much of a resource uh, that uh, is as useful as possible for the institutions, uh, the idea would be that we would also um, have a, a, a number of fields uh, that could be um, used or not used depending upon the preference of the institution that they could define themselves. For example, um, I might like to include whether someone has union status or I might, for whatever reason, I might actually like to include um, if uh, someone's salary uh, in this. Now again, these would not be viewable outside of our institutions. And so it, it will come with some of these preloaded, but we could customize it. The, um, some of the features that we're anticipating are that we would uh, be able to uh, retain previous versions of PDs. Uh, so we could see, uh, as a position changed over time, that we would be able to see the, uh, the, the previous version. Uh, and this would also be useful uh, for uh, maintaining positions that become vacant over time. Uh, and then uh, the, we would also uh, assume that the system will support the establishment of review schedules uh, in, in case that's a feature that's useful, either by using the dates and in running reports or in some other way. And that uh, we would also um, be able to uh, customize uh, internal only reports. These are some assumed features of the architecture. Okay, so that ends the orientation, uh, the, the part of the discussion to get us all on the same page. And now um, we're, we'd like to move into uh, the data collection needs assessment and, uh, and your 
active participation. But I guess before we do that, does anyone have any uh, questions about the material that I've, I've submitted as part of the orientation? Brian, this is Angela. I, I think I was under a mis misunderstanding. I had thought originally that this was only going to be for librarian positions, but from what you just described, it's for all of our positions. Am I on the right page now? Well, the um, I, the the intention is that it would be able to be used for all positions. Um, and, uh, and and at the University of Florida, we would certainly use it for our staff positions. Um, but I think um, the level to which it's adopted uh, by the institution is really going to be up to the institution. Oh, okay, thanks. But it, but it'll certainly we anticipate that um, it will. Um, the uh, intention is certainly that it will. Um, it, it'll have the capacity. Um, and then uh, Melinda's uh, shared that she doesn't want to duplicate the functions that reside quite adequately in university HR systems. Um, I, I, I can completely understand that. Um, I think uh, to the extent um, that this uh, is either uh, burdensome or does not create um, uh, value to the institutions that we'll see um, uh, that that'll that'll hinder adoption. And again, the idea is that uh, by this being adopted, uh, that it becomes a, a, a useful resource. Um, I've uh, heard, uh, and, and we're hoping to hear from institutions that have an effective system that supports the management of these, because we're thinking that there may be some feature or design elements that we want to to emulate in this product. Um, my understanding from other institutions is that many of them are in the same circumstance at the University of Florida where we do not have a uh, university system that um, adequately or in any way supports this function. And so, um, so I, I, I appreciate your concerns, uh, Melinda, and, and I think um, that uh, the uh, yeah, I, I think that there are some institutions that have this. We've actually uh, uh, asked um, uh, that uh, the folks from Alberta uh, that we have representation um, uh, from Kathleen, uh, who's the HR officer there, uh, because they do have a, a functional system. Uh, the uh, response rate uh, from the uh, ARL institutions was um, really quite encouraging for the idea that we would do this. Um, the, um, uh, I think that the, um, I think that if we, uh, if, if we have the expectation that this will be adopted by 100% of the ARLs, I think that's an unreasonable expectation. But I think if we get um, solid, uh, particular, you know, something reflecting the feedback that came back from the ARL directors, I think there's a. I think it'll definitely be a viable and useful system. Um, and there, Melissa, or I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time reading. Melinda uh, has said that she's concerned about the time frame for submitting up-to-date position descriptions. At Rice, HR review is required when a position is vacated or put up for refilling. But there may be few positions that have up-to-date PDs. Um, well, I think that that's probably. You know, I think that's kind of a, a situation that is um, not unheard of at um, academic libraries and probably other entities. You know, I, as part of my salesmanship, I'll tell you that hopefully the system will make it easier or um, will make us more disciplined about maintaining our PDs. Um, at the at the University of Florida, we have incorporated into our uh, annual evaluations. Uh, the idea that the position descriptions will be updated. Um, we've been largely dependent upon the um, supervisors to um, to do that uh, they, with, their, with their employee. And um, we do receive annual assignments, uh, documents from the uh, librarians. And so we've been probably as reasonably good on this. So ours are up to date. But uh, we're hoping that the features may serve as an opportunity for people um, to 
to begin over a course of time uh, if they adopt the system, getting their physician descriptions up to date and using it. Um, there's no hard deadline for people to submit uh, their physician descriptions. We do have a hard deadline in mind for the system to become available. And so people could begin to populate it. And, um, and we also have discussed the opportunities that people would have to submit their, uh, if their PDs are up to date, an opportunity for people to submit their uh, documents as a batch um, instead of doing the kind of manual that you would expect as, as more of a maintenance over time. But these are excellent points, and, and I appreciate you bringing them up. Um, I just wanted to uh, add something also, um, if this is a good time, Brian. Sure. Um, what I... What I think um, is interesting about this, uh, the PD Bank, is that it's flexible if one institution doesn't really need the extra features for their institutional level information, uh, there isn't any requirement that they use those features. And if uh, another institution only wants to up upload librarian um, position, position vacancy announcement or position descriptions, they have the freedom of doing that, whereas others may want to upload more. So it's really going to be very flexible and each institution may use it and um, and uh, use it in different ways. So I think that's also uh, some good points. Okay, thanks. Um, well, let's go ahead and um, start talking about the first um, kind of a assessment that we were hoping to, to do today and that is uh, to get a feel um, for what kind of documents we're currently uh, accumulating and um, I, I think it might be to the extent that it's useful we might start first um, by talking about staff employees um, if, if it makes sense at your institution to differentiate between um, the professional positions which would be librarians and, and other positions and then the uh, support and paraprofessional staff so can could you guys give kind of a, a sense of, uh, do you, and we've heard from Melinda that there may be some issues with them being up to date, but in general, um, are we maintaining position descriptions for staff positions? At Alabama, um, all of our staff positions, both professional and hourly, are maintained centrally by HR, and they do now have a database system in place. so. It's all online. Um, we should as um, update them as they become vacant, and I really try to keep up with that. But you know, we have a few people who've been here for 20 or 30 years, and maybe theirs haven't been updated. But um, when we also uh, institute a job family program for our hourly library assistant positions, we upgraded all of those. Position. So the majority of ours are pretty current, and they are all now online with the university and the database. Okay, thank you. Anybody else uh, willing to share uh, the level of position description documentation they have for uh, their staff employees? Brian, this is Sherry Williams from the University of Buffalo. We have three types of um, staff in the libraries here at UB. We have faculty who are our librarians. And they typically don't have a position description other than what we use to post the position. Um, we use that um, description after they're hired to create what we call a condition of employment letter. And that's kept in their file uh, locally within the libraries. And that does change from time to time, and we try to keep those updated. Um, we typically need that when the position is reappointed. And then most definitely we need an updated condition of employment letter when the person is being put uh, forward for tenure. Um, the other classification of staff that we have are professional positions. And we do have position descriptions for these. Um, we try to keep these updated, but for the most part, uh, similar to Angela's situation, some of these people have been around for a long time and their position has changed, but their position description was never updated. Um, we do require, we are required, because we're a unionized shop, that for professionals we keep uh, what's called a performance program that's done annually, and that typically describes in great detail what that person does uh, for that 12-month period. And then at the end of that year, they're evaluated based on that program. 
And the union's more concerned here, at least in the state system, um, with the public, that uh, we keep those up to date. But I would really like to be able to, and I have been in the process of um, updating job descriptions for our professional employees. And then the third classification employee that we have are classified staff, and they're also they're in a separate union, um, and their jobs um, are fairly limited, so we don't really keep anything other than a performance program for them. But we also, for the professionals, when we do create a position description, we have to provide an organizational chart. We also have to do the FLSA uh, for that position. And um, the other thing we have to do, which we're required to do, is a point factoring so that uh, when the position goes through our classification services here at the university, that it's classified correctly according to um, the State University of New York standards. OK. So do you so are these documents, um, and with the, 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 the different variety of documents, do these, um, uh, are they completed in the HR management uh, software? Are these Word documents or PDF documents or? Well, the, um, <coughs> excuse me, the position descriptions um, I create here in-house, and then um, they do become uh, PDF documents that get uh, entered into a central system we have. It's our recruitment system, but it's also a job position uh, management system. But it's very limited, because um, if I have a position description that's longer than 300 characters, um, which most of mine are, <laughs> uh, sure. I have to attach it as a PDF. And once I attach it, I can't get it back out. So it's virtually useless to me. Um, I can put it in there, but I just I can't get it out. So I maintain it um, in-house. And so that's, I'm pretty excited about this project, because I'd love to be able to have a central database where I could go and retrieve what I actually put into it. Um, we do that for all our professional staff. Um, the only time for faculty uh, is when we're initially recruiting, and the position description would be part of uh, the recruitment package. But once we do the hire, um, the condition of employment letter is kept in-house, and it's not in any kind of system other than what we have right here. Well, I was wondering, part of what made me ask that was the idea that um, it might be useful, and uh, you know, I need to I need to consult with my team. It, it, it may be it might be useful that on the uh, internal level that you might have a position and there may be more than one document associated with that and that may allow you to uh, warehouse um, and maintain and retrieve and all these functionalities that we've been thinking about with position descriptions yeah. it may make it useful where you know you have something that's a position description that might be of interest and useful uh, on this industry level that we're thinking about, but there's also the, the possibility for one position that you might be able to have multiple documents associated with it um, since they're maybe part and parcel of the same process. Um, That's true, and with, with our position descriptions, the actual content, um, we have a template that the university provides us that we have to use. So. We have to include things like not not only the duties and responsibilities, but um, minimum education and um, what what types of experience or what kinds of experience is required for the position. We also have to detail um, what we consider the most complex or difficult duties yes. associated with the position, um, the supervisory or the direct reporting relationships of the position, and then um, the agencies or or offices that this position has contact with. And then interestingly, we also have to include um, what the most serious consequences um, that could result from errors by the incumbent in this position. So we have to give a lot of um, required information for every position description that we create here at the university. OK. Well, thanks for sharing. the. Um I, uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and talk about the University of Florida. The, uh, at UF, we have um, for, uh, f for our library faculty, um, those, we really have two classes of, of employees, and, or two kinds of employees. We have um, of benefited employees. We have our library faculty, and then we have um, positions that are, regardless of whether they're professional or paraprofessional, that are categorized as staff employees. 
for all of our staff positions, we maintain position descriptions. And, and as I've mentioned before, through the evaluation process, we try and keep them up to date. Um, for our librarians, we have, and we we don't we don't have we do not have a position description. Though I think it's permissible for us to do it, we just haven't maintained position descriptions. We do, um, if it's a recent hire, we'll look at the position vacancy announcement. Um, and if it's, uh, and, and we also have an annual activity report that is associated with, uh, that includes their duties um, that, uh, that is submitted annually as part of the evaluation process. So, uh, you know, I, I guess the, the point of this is that one of the things that we're going to have to consider is the variety of documents uh, that for these different categories of employees and also that that there may be some use at the institutional level uh, where um, we, we might want to actually be able to have, you know, a, a position description type document that's, you know, maybe part of the PD bank. But to make this uh, as useful of a system as possible, you may be ab able to also submit other documents um, and determine that. And the person who keeps me um, straight for technology um, Mark Sullivan responded that that was absolutely when I brought it up before. Um, there was a move on. there was a entry um, in the chat from Melinda. She said that at Rice, their HR database contains position descriptions for all positions that have been refilled recently, plus some more. Everything else is manual and in various stages of currency. Uh, she also added, added that uh, there are four promotion levels for librarians as well as salary incentives and some benefits that are not reflected in the HR uh, database. So that might be some things that could be added. Sure. I think maybe um, some of this, the self-selecting um, fields might serve that. I hate to move on from this topic. And um, if you have something, if we have time at the end and you had something that you wanted to add to this topic, um, please, I'm, I'm hoping there'll be time, but uh, there's a lot of things we want to talk about, so I'm going to move forward. If not, feel free um, to send an email. Um, we have an email address we'll show at the end. Um, so these, um, I think we've gotten into a little bit about how we manage these. Um, at UF, for example, we have the position descriptions. We manage these uh, centrally in a, um, we keep them as Word files or scanned images uh, if we don't have it as a Word file. And we try and use a file naming uh, convention to where we can organize these. Uh, but they're not searchable in a, in a useful way. Um, so we will be an adopter of this system. Uh, does anyone else? Uh, there are some of you who have uh, university systems that, that are part of this and may not be completely satisfactory or may be completely satisfactory. But is anyone willing to share how you're currently managing your position descriptions? I can chime in for a moment. That's, this is Nancy Hewison from Purdue. Um, we do not have a university managed resource for position descriptions that is easily accessible to us, although our um, HR, central HR, um, is working on making those things more accessible. So we maintain actually um, files of these. I think that basically they're Excel documents. We maintain them um, in a, a folder that is accessible to everyone within the library's faculty and staff. Um, as mentioned by several of my colleagues, we do not actually have position descriptions for faculty, um, but we do, have, we, we do have the requirement that all of our non-faculty positions, whether exempt or non-exempt, and there are some of both, but that's weird. We don't need to go there. And all of our non-exempt support positions all have to be using this position description form that Central HR provides. Okay. Anyone else uh, have kind of a unique way in which you're managing these or that you're interested in sharing? Yeah, this is John. <clears throat> Can you hear me, Brian? Yes, sir. Um, at Houston, we basically maintain position announcements, and we do not maintain an actual database of descriptions. It's simply announcements when we're recruiting a position, although those are retained and essentially form the basis 
for the ongoing performance management process. But they do not get updated until a position goes vacant and we're re-recruiting it. That's for the librarians. Everyone else in the organization are considered classified staff. There are canned job descriptions for the classified staff that are maintained by the university. We do have the opportunity to customize those when we put an announcement out to recruit one of the classified staff positions and the university's database system for those maintains the customized language that we add in so I can always go back and pull out that material from you know a historical perspective if I need to. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, th I really think it's pretty clear that um, that we're going to hear from a lot of places that are going to be in the same situation as Houston and as Florida in that we do not maintain position descriptions per se for uh, librarians and um, I, I think that it's really quite likely that we're going to have a variety of types of documents that people submit and I would think that we would those would include position descriptions obviously but they might also include the advertisements and so we're envisioning that we need to that we need to that the system has to have the ability not only to accept those but to differentiate those for the purposes of us of us um, reviewing them uh, you know as a bank um, the metadata that we assume uh, that we would collect uh, for each of these positions um, that would make it easier for us to organize them on the institutional level but would also make it easier uh, for searching on the industry level uh, would be again the whether it's a full-time or part-time I'm not going to go through all of these again but is do these seem to make sense as far as ways of describing uh, the documents that we're collecting and is there anything that's missing does anyone have any comments on, on this um, you know, presumed standard metadata that we would collect? This is Nancy Hewison again. Um, I like the, the list of proposed metadata. The thing that it would also um, profit us to have in there is whether or not it's a faculty position. I know this gets sticky because then you, we have faculty um, systems in some of our institutions that are tenure track, some that are not some that their promotion process goes just through the libraries and some something specialized and parallel to the university and others where it's completely enrolled in the university's promotion and tenure system. But if we could boil this down to something that is useful um, to us, it might be helpful to have some indication of faculty status for particular positions. Okay. Well, I think that's great. Um, the intention in the, po in the position type which is a very vague statement. The idea is that when we would submit that we would select as either a professional librarian, another professional or support or prayer professional staff position. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, one of the things we might not should consider, as you pointed out, because the faculty status is going to vary, if we might not have that as one of the standard um, optional um, institutional level decisions that we can make. Um, at UF it would make sense perhaps for us to track tenure accruing versus non-tenure accruing. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I'm wondering if just having it in there, the, the downside of doing it that way, well the upside is it's available, the downside is it's not in that that's an institutional level data, it would make it where we weren't searching. Um, where we couldn't search all of the submissions based upon that as a criteria, do you feel that there would be that that's that, that the loss of the ability to search is um, is detrimental? Actual Nancy Hewison, actually, um, what you're suggesting, Brian, makes sense on one level. On another level, and this is not so much perhaps the reason that this data bank would exist, but when we are looking at Purdue, um, to, when we're putting someone up for promotion and we are looking for external reviewers, it's useful to find people with similar positions who might be asked to write a review of this candidate's progress toward promotion and tenure. And the real strength comes from people who are in faculty positions themselves. 
So <laughs> there's a, another possible use that is, as I say, not the direct intent of the creation of this um, data bank. Well, I, I wonder if uh, using the professional librarian um, identifier, my only concern on the metadata is, for the standard metadata, is I want to be relatively, I, I, you know, as far as, I don't want to make it too cumbersome for people to submit and maintain the data. Um, and I'm wondering if we do it on a professional librarian. But I, don't, I, I, I appreciate your input, and I think it's something that we need to think about how to address the need. Um, and how to, um, but to balance with the, 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 how cumbersome it is for, for that, to, for it to be a field associated with mm -hmm. every position. Maybe we could do it as a, that question pops up if it's a professional, if you indicate it's a professional librarian. Like we could ask whether it's tenure um, accruing or not. Um, yes, that would be helpful. Okay. But I, do, I certainly also do subscribe to what you were just saying about let's not overly customize this and make it too cumbersome. Yeah, I, I, we, because we're all going to be best served to the extent that it's adopted and maintained over time. There's a comment by Melinda um, who says, a position versus employment type could use more evoca evocative names. I think this is a great start, and we will learn more about um, what we've left out as we start data entry. I think it's good to have an early data entry exercise involving multiple institutions with a small sample spanning local position types, maybe four to six positions from each of us. That is, that is uh, genius. Um, I, um, I, I think that's a terrific idea um, for us to approach it that way, um, kind of as a metadata beta testing. Um, and Melinda identifies herself as a cataloger. I am a, uh, my entire professional career started off as an HR professional. I consider HR professionals and catalogers separated at, at birth. Um, and um, so that's a great idea. Um, any other thoughts on the metadata before we move on to, I, I, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the job types that are possible. Well, if any ideas occur to you that you want to contribute later, feel free to do by email. But the, um, the job types that, um, again, we, we want to make this data as usable um, a, as possible on, on the national level, um, but we, we don't want it to be overly cumbersome. Um, these are some examples of potential job types. Many of these you will um, see uh, if you fill out the ARL salary survey, you'll recognize them from that, um, the, but it's, it's clearly it's an expanded list from there. And um, so uh, I'm not going to read every one of these, uh, but if you would take a minute and look through these, um, and if you, if you think that um, this is too hair splitting, or if you think that um, there's something that's missing, um, you know, I'd, I'd be interested in, in hearing your thoughts on that. And the idea is that when someone submits, a, uh, uploads a document, that they would have a drop-down menu and they would be asked to pick which of these best fits um, the, the, the majority of the duties of the position. And then on the institutional level, if I'm interested, I, I would be able to do keyword searches of the documents, but I would also be able to narrow it and say, uh, give me every reference librarian um, or every reference and exempt position. Um, so we, as we search through the documents, uh, the, the national database, that these would be, these would help us narrow our searches. So does anyone have any thoughts on these? Too many, too few? I don't see it, but I could be missing it. But I don't see special collections as a job type, and I don't know if you intentionally didn't. I see rare books and manuscripts. Well, we have archivists. Or ar archivists. Um, yeah, we have archivist slash curator, which is borrowed from the, um, that's borrowed from the ARL salary survey. Is there a different type of um, special collections pos um, position? Um, I'm just thinking about our, our special collections and 
there are librarians there that would not necessarily fall into the archivist or the curator, but that's just a, that's just um, you know semantics words. I'm, and I think that people have enough choice with the archivists and the uh, rare books and manuscripts um, types. So I, I don't think it'll make that much difference. Well, I, I am happy to first to, to consider something else, but the other ones that would seem to to be possible um, fits would be the subject specialist and the reference. Um, those are pretty general, uh, but uh, those might fit. Um, but if, the, if, if it occurs to you a, a job type that makes sense um, that, you, you know, on thinking about it, that you, you think there's a term that would capture something that's different, uh, please feel free to, to let us know. Um, does anyone okay. else have any? Th does anyone else have any thoughts on these? Uh, Nancy Hewison, I'm mulling over what we now call our liaison librarians, and I guess we would probably put them under subject specialists. They, they are embedded in courses. They, they assist faculty with their data management plans. Um, they have some collection building functions, although they're not bibliographers in the older sense um, of, the, of the term. And they, they do um, reference, but only on referral from the non-professional and um, non-library faculty professional staff who actually now do the, the majority of our reference work. But as I say, I think I could put them into subject specialists because that's mostly what they are, although there are liaisons who aren't. Um, the other one that, that jumps to mind that is pretty specific, but certainly a growing area in some of our libraries is um, GIS um, librarians. Yes. So I think Melinda has a comment here that I was just thinking the same thing, that um, she says we are all slicing and dicing PDs so variably, especially in light of budget cuts that we need to be able to check all that apply. Archivist, curator versus rare books, um, manuscripts, question mark. Everything needs to be areas, not titles, to uh, accommodate staff levels. So a lot of these reflect sort of librarian positions, archivist, curator. Um, but where would you put the staff who are in those areas? So um, thank you for the comment. And then uh, Judy says, uh, how about data management and data curation? I think those are those are great suggestions, and I think the idea that uh, these, uh, you know, I think that the ARL salary survey is geared towards staff. I think we should think about um, the um, are, are geared towards uh, the professional positions. I think that we should definitely uh, think about um, uh, about terms that would be meaningful for the staff positions also, um, and so. Uh, I, I think that's great. If you, if any of these areas, if you're willing to contribute um, some descriptors, uh, either for professional professions or for the staff positions, um, you know, I, there's nothing on here about stack maintenance, and we still have folks whose primary responsibilities are stack maintenance. So I, th I think that there's room for improvement on this, and, and the idea that people would be able to select multiple ones of these, um, I think, is is certainly. Um, a viable option too. Uh, clinical librarian position as a possibility. Uh, I, I think that that um, I think that and the liaison uh, would there would a clinical librarian be different? Um, would the liaison librarian? I know it's not exactly that, but I, I'm wondering if that doesn't fit um, between that and a subject specialist. Well, our intention. Yeah, our intention, Brian, is we're going to be hiring several clinical librarians, and we see them um, working with students and residents uh, in the dental school and the medical school here at UB. Um, so they'll, in, in the typical sense of a liaison position, they'll be actually much more than a liaison, because we have liaison uh, librarians right now who work with faculty and students within a specific department. Um, the clinical librarian I think is much more specialized 
Um, most of our liaisons support entire schools, and we're anticipating that the clinical librarians will be working um, right with the students and the faculty, right in the clinics and at the hospitals. So their responsibilities might be a bit different from a liaison or a subject specialist, at least here at UB. Okay. Well, even uh, if we do not... At, um, UA, we are using the title clinical librarians, and we've hired about six or seven lately, and we're using that term for renewable positions that do not have any kind of tenure um, responsibilities so that they are dedicated strictly to their um, position responsibilities. And so I think if we use the term clinical as a, as a metadata or a drop down or a type, that it would maybe need to have more definition to it because as the person who was just speaking said, there are some that work in a really clinical setting, but then there may be other institutions that are using the title clinical and it's more um, uh, parallel with adjunct or renewable or, or something else. So we probably need to be careful about using that. Well, I think that one of the, if we're talking about the use of job types as a as an element of helping us find positions that we're interested in, uh, the way that other people are defining the work, I do think there's the concept of us, uh, of if I'm interested in finding that, I might be able to define it, get to it by electing that I am only interested in positions for medical libraries and then I'm interested, and, and I could use that as a working title. I think there's some other ways. I'm not saying that we shouldn't use it as a job type, but I don't think that's necessarily the only way that people could find their ways to those position descriptions. Um, if you have some more thoughts on this, time is really unfortunately short. Um, I want to go ahead and at least introduce the other areas that we were interested in getting your feedback, and we may have to um, fall back to um, if you'd be kind enough in sending us an email and going that route. Um, well, we thought that some of the key features to this would be that it would support reporting, uh, that it would um, help us uh, either through the reporting or some other feature establish review schedules, and that would also archive and provide access to um, previous PDs um, or other uh, documents. We've expanded it to that. Um, are there any other features that jump out of you, uh, out at you, either in a system that you currently have? Um, one of the features that I think we've added in the course of this conversation is that you might be able to have multiple documents, only one of them viewable as part of the PD bank. Um, do any others uh, jump out at you that we should be thinking about? Okay. If they occur to you later, please send us an email. And then also, the most open-ended question possible, what are we missing or what else should we be thinking about as we're starting to narrow down the specifics of what this system will look like? Um, we welcome that feedback from you. Okay, well, I hear none, but, but if something occurs to you, please um, feel free to send us an email. Um, and it is we're going to end almost exactly on time. It's 11.59 Eastern Time. And uh, we'd like to thank you for your participation. Uh, your input has been terrific. And it's really kind of changed my thoughts on this. On this, And, it's, and I'm assuming that's for the rest of the team. Uh, if you want to get in contact with us, our primary contact, uh, you feel free to contact either Bonnie or myself. And we have a dedicated email address that's uh, provided uh, on the screen. And that's also uh, Bonnie's direct number. Um, if you want to schedule a time to talk about this, we'd be happy to follow up with you. And we'll send you a, uh, as Bonnie's noted, you'll get a copy of the slides uh, and have access to the presentation. And uh, without further ado, we'd like to thank you very much for your time. I know you're busy people. We're excited about the project, and it's going to be better because of your input. Thank you very much, everybody, uh, for joining us. And we thank you. Well, have a good afternoon or the rest of the morning if you're not on the East Coast.